Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. Hey, this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. Good morning. Good morning again. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Monday to you folks out there. Yes. We hope you have gas. Oh my gosh, yeah. In your car. <laughs> <laughs> I have not had to go to the gas station since all of this happened because I had like filled up the day before. <laughs> yes. We filled up this past weekend our cars mm-hmm. and just so happened because we there's none here. Nope, nope. I but have not. Kinda... I will say, I've between you guys and the news, a lot of the time the news is North Carolina. Like it's like North Carolina panicked. Well, I know there was a few states that they oh. mentioned. But we I haven't seen that here. Like, oh, good. I've seen lines at gas stations. I mean, I have no idea what's happening because I'm hardly ever out of the house. But <laughs> <laughs> when I drive somewhere, I've not seen this as mm-hmm. an issue. But maybe it was. I don't know. Yeah, we our gas stations are – there's like caution tape around the pumps or, or bags on the handles. You cannot get gas. Mm. So, Wow. Well, hopefully it's resolved soon now that I think it will be. I think pipeline is just up. fine. I think right. everyone needs to calm down, get in your closet, get a drink. Christy's having a mimosa this morning. Uh, always. <laughs> yeah. Every Thursday. It's like my new favorite thing. I did make it during iced, the day. I made an iced coffee today, which is pretty indulgent for me. We were just talking about so. Yeah. And it's very good. It's yummy. Yeah. Normal. Yum. Yes, so cheers to that. What do you so have, did you have a nice? On? Well, I was going to say, did you have a nice Mother's Day? Because I had a nice Mother's Day. Yes, I did. It was great. Yeah. Went on my little dates for the week with my kids. And then my husband made, cooked all day long on Mother's Day. He made brunch. He made dinner. It was very nice. Got flowers. Nice. Yeah. What about you? Lovely. I mean, it was, it was a fine day. Didn't do a whole lot. I had ordered food to pick up at my favorite place and heat it up. It was a nice spread that they were like offering for Mother's Day. Um, but I will say, I think I got, I mean, maybe the best compliment ever at dinner that night, but also, you know how sometimes we say, at what point do we think that having a beverage is a problem for us? You know, we kind of joke about that. (laughs) Well, so we're sitting there at dinner and Emery at dinner, we always do, what's your favorite part of the day? Like, yes. I love you know, that. Everybody goes around. You have to find something that was good about your day, even if your day stunk. Like it could be like uh, coming home from work and seeing my lovely family. Sometimes that's Emery's because like, that's just the best part of his day. Aww. Well, he decided to say, um, "What's your favorite thing about mom?" For oh, Mother's we did that day. too. Yeah. So went around the table. Nice, cute the little things. You know, puts them on the spot, but they come up with cute things. And Langdon says, "My littlest. He's seven. He said, "Ah, I just love all of mom's talents. Okay. So I was like, well, what talents? Like, can you name one? You know, because sometimes he says these words that he hears because he's just like, I just want to use that word, you know, whatever. Right. I'm like, well, what talents? And he's like, she's really great at drinking wine. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to have to talk to him. <laughs> He's going to grow up and get married to somebody and they're not going to drink wine <laughs> quite the same as mommy. And he's going to be like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I was like, yeah, and literally everybody at the table is like, yep, she's good at that. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to have a reputation. <laughs> uh, whatever. I mean, well, it is you can it put is. it on them. I know. And you are why. (laughs) And you are exactly why. Thank you so much for making mommy the best wine drinker in the world. (laughs) Happy Mother's Day. (laughs) Cheers. Cheers. So I hope you guys had just as lovely as Mother's Day. (laughs) We hope you're as good at drinking wine as we are. Well, Christy's the best. (laughs) I am. It's my my talent. My number one talent. (laughs) You are very talented. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to talk to him about your other talents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a case for you. Okay. Let's jump right in. This case is a suggestion from our good friend, Carrie. 
who is here in North Carolina. Carrie has suggested some local cases for us before. This is another doozy. You're going to like it. Thank you again, Carrie. This case happened in North Carolina, like I said, in Wake Forest in 2016. And I remember it. I had, um, I was living there. I have that in my notes, actually, because <laughs> I had forgotten about it. But after I started my research and was really delving into it, I remember this occurring. I wasn't, I think we've talked about this before, before we did true crime podcasting and researching, we weren't super dialed into the true crime world. So I can't say that I followed the case necessarily, but it was close to home and I knew about it happening. So thank you, Carrie, for reminding me of this story and that it should be told. Mm -hmm. So the backstory of these folks is lost or never reported. So there's going to be some holes we typically like to start with. This is where they were born in their lives and kind of set the scene. I'm not going to do that in this case. I apologize if you love that, but we have plenty to talk about here. So don't worry. Let me tell you, okay. there's a lot to say. So in 2016, living in Wake Forest, North Carolina is the Mazella family and my family and your family in 2016. Yes. We all lived here. Best. That was the great times, but also the Mazella family was living here. So we have Sandy and Mazella. He was 47 years old at the time. And then we have his wife, Stephanie Mazella, who was 43 years old. And they have two children, a boy who is 10 and a daughter who is 14, all living as a family here in Wake Forest. Also, there was in another house, not in their house, but close by is Sandy's mother, Elaine Mazella, who is 76, and her husband, Salvatore Sussman, who goes by the name Sal. And then also down the road, we have Stephanie's brother, Joe Kern. So we have Sandy okay. and Stephanie and their two kids. Sandy's mom and her husband. And then Stephanie's brother. This whole Got family it. was originally from Mil New Milford, New Jersey. And they got tired of the cold and came around 2008, moved down south, along with everyone else from up north, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Welcome in. Welcome in. It's fine. <laughs> so first, Sandy and Stephanie and the kiddos moved down not long after extended family visits, loved it, also moves down too. We know how that goes. That's happened to people we know. Stephanie was, <laughs> who, are you, who are you speaking of? <laughs> Your mama. <laughs> My mom? <laughs> Stephanie was an ICU nurse at Wake Med. It's a big hospital here in the Raleigh area. And she was very loved by her family, friends, coworkers. And she also sold unique cosmetics. You probably have heard of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sandy the husband, owned his own company called Advanced Mowing and Landscaping, which I mean, it does, you know, the obvious things. And Elaine and Sal, mom and stepdad, were retired and loved spending time with their grandchildren and were involved in their local church. And Joe, the brother, just came. He was new to the area in 2016, but he had just come. I think he was actually coming down to kind of work in the family business a little bit as well, the mowing business. Mm -hmm. So not only were Sandy and Stephanie able to get their family to move down to North Carolina with them, but Sandy, the husband, also had a best friend that moved down south with them to be a partner in the landscaping business. This was Joe Sander, J or I'm sorry, John Sander. John was an old friend from New Jersey, and he moved himself and his wife and three kids down to start this business with Sandy. John even ended up buying the house right next door to the Mazellas. Oh. So they were best friends, they were business partners, and they were neighbors. And it's reported that their families were very close. They would do vacations and barbecues and Super Bowl parties together, New Year's Eve. They would take vacations together. They would do holidays together. I mean, they were family. You know, they were mm -hmm. a chosen family together. They were very close. And the Mazella kids even called John Uncle John. 
Oh, okay. It's also reported that Sandy and John, again, were best friends. They had a great relationship. They hung out together all the time. They would often smoke weed together after work. Like almost every day, they would come home from work, meet on somebody's porch. Mm -hmm. So in late 2015, the landscaping company that Sandy and John ran began having financial problems. And the Mazellas began suspecting that John was embezzling money from the business. Oh. So he was drinking too much. He was smoking a lot of weed. The relationship between Sandy and John really began to deteriorate. It was getting started getting bad, contentious. Mm -hmm. They kind of started harassing each other. John kept joking that he and his wife had a sexual encounter with Stephanie, which is Sandy's wife. And like Mm -hmm. all the time he would joke about that, which was never uh, corroborated in any way. Mm -hmm. But it was like they thought it was funny or John thought it was funny. And Sandy was like, it's not funny. Like, this is my wife. Stop. You're such a butthole. They just didn't like each other anymore. They would send nasty text messages back and forth. They would complain about things that they were doing on each other's property. Like, I don't like that fence. I don't like that tree, whatever. It just started getting nasty. Mm -hmm. So then one of the Mazella children bravely reported to her parents that Uncle John had inappropriately touched her. I don't know if it's one occasion or multiple occasions. I don't know. But as you can Mm. imagine, this turned a bad relationship real bad. Quick. Right. Yeah, no kidding. Police and Child Protective Services became involved, and the family was literally at war. It got to the point where they were straight up threatening each other. They were saying that the other one was like doing harmful things to like each other's pets. So like both were accusing each other of this. The Mazella family began referring to John as Chester, as in like Chester the molester. Chester the molester. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. It's reported that the two families would like play loud music into each other's yard and yell things at each other. In front of neighbors, they would argue like everybody knew that this relationship was bad, that they were wow. hated each other. They were fighting. And I mean, they are from New Jersey. Not that I'm saying anything wrong, but they're loud and obnoxious people. Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I'm sorry. New York, New Jersey. Come on. I will say something I can say with certainty is don't cross them <laughs> because. No, I mean, Italian name, Mazzaro. Mazzella. Yeah. Or Mazzello. Yeah. You, like, come on. Like, I don't know. Just to me, like not surprising that they're loud and obnoxious. Got it. Okay. I'm just going to, I'm just put it out there. <laughs> okay. I think, I think we're going to find that that's true, but. Okay, uh, John had reportedly told Sandy that he wanted to kill him and put him in a box. And Mm -hmm. Sandy is reported to have said to a friend of his that he was just waiting for John to make a move onto his property so he could legally take him out. So it's not good. It's not good. So we're getting threatening text message. We're verbally threatening each other. Everybody is aware of this bad relationship. And it got so bad that the Mazellas had decided to move and actually began packing up their house with plans of moving in the next couple of weeks. The Mazella family was also granted a temporary restraining order against John because the threats that he was making to Sandy were so bad. Like, he was legitimately saying, I'm going to kill you. So they got a temporary restraining yeah. order. And this was in February of 2016. So I'm going to wow. tell I, you. I honestly don't remember this. Really? I don't know why. Maybe I will later on in your discussion. But. I remembered it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what happens after this restraining order, right after the break. This episode is brought to you by Best Fiends. Hey guys, do you find yourself needing a little me time and enjoy solving puzzles like me? Well, let me introduce you to Best Fiends. It's my favorite way to take a break from, well, let's face it, we all need breaks from a lot of things these days. 
Best Fiends is a stress-free puzzle game that challenges your brain, and they come up with new levels and challenges all the time, so the fun never stops. I'm on level 263, and I have 17 fiends. Jean and Temper are just a couple of my favorites, and I guess you'll just have to play to see what I'm talking about. They really did a great job creating a colorful world of puzzles. So, join me and millions of others who are already playing this game. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. So John, who was being accused of these things, had this restraining order now against him, was obviously very angry about it. He was very distraught, and he felt that he was being accused of doing things that he didn't do. He said he never stole money from the business, he never was inappropriate with a child, and that he felt like his livelihood and family and reputation were all being ruined based on lies. None of it was true. So on March 23rd of 2016, John went to a mental health clinic in Raleigh to be checked in. Mm. He went for help. He was Mm. told that he would have to pay $250 for an evaluation. And at that time, he did not have the money. So he left. Oh, gosh. Also on this day, coincidentally, the temporary restraining order that had been put in place for John to stay away from the Mazzella family was expiring. So on March 24th, which is the following day, Sandy went before a judge in the county and requested that the temporary restraining order be put, be changed to permanent, like a one-year restraining order and put in place against John. Sandy said that he feared for his life, that he feared for his family's lives and safety and well-being, but this request was denied by the judge. Oh, wow. The judge ruled that there wasn't sufficient grounds for a permanent restraining order and that John had a legitimate reason to contact the Mazellas and Sandy because they ran a business together. Mm -hmm. So he denied it. So John finds out that they try to file for this permanent restraining order and feels like he's being further harassed by the Mazella family. And he gets mad. And the next morning, Friday, March 25th, he goes over to Sandy's like property. They meet, you know, at the fence line or whatever. And they're arguing. They're fighting about this. They're screaming at each other. They're yelling. It got so bad and so escalated that neighbors called the cops on them. The cops come. They broke up the fight. But since the restraining order has had expired, there wasn't legally much yeah. they could do. They couldn't charge anyone for arguing on their own property. So they kind of separated the fight and broke it up. And both men went back to their respective corners and they left. <laughs> <laughs> Until around six o'clock that day. At Uh-oh. six o'clock on the same day, Friday, March 25th, a nine, several, 911 calls start coming in. People were calling saying that they heard shots fired in their neighborhood on their street. Then a man calls and says that he was driving down the road to either go home or come back home, one or the other. And he sees a man running down the street screaming, picks him up. And the man says, somebody came in my house and shot all of my family. So this person who picks him up calls 911, finds out that the man who has been running down the street reporting this is Sal, the stepfather. So the police are there within minutes, two, three minutes. They are there. And what they find was chaos. There are neighbors everywhere. There are children everywhere running around crazy. Everyone's freaking out. And Sal is freaking out saying everyone in the house is dead. Someone came in my house and shot everyone. It's dead. So the police go into the Mazella home and they find Elaine Mazella shot to death in the kitchen. Then they go, they search the house more and they find the husband and wife, Sandy and Stephanie Mazella shot to death on the back porch. Sal, Sandy's stepfather, was there but was able to escape the home without any injury. Also, the Mazella's daughter, who was 14 at the time, was also home and locked herself in her bedroom during the shooting, then was able to 
escape and get oh, out. Oh, thank unharmed. goodness. Joe, Stephanie's brother, was also at the home, but was in the backyard with the dogs oh, gosh. when the shooting started. And he had been able to run around the house and get away from it. So there were three victims, three survivors. It's a lot of people. It's chaos. Now, the Mazellas also have a son, and he was not home at the time mm. this happened. Thank God. So Sal immediately tells the police that the shooter had been John Sander. And he just mm -hmm. lives just right over there. So police determine that John had gotten into the house by walking through the open garage. So the garage door, you know, the big door was up. And he walked into the garage and then shot the doorknob of the door that leads from the garage to the kitchen. And that's how he gained entry to the home. So okay. excuse me while I go close my garage door. Seriously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's scary. Okay. So he first sees Elaine in the kitchen and shoots her and then goes through the house and finds Sandy and Stephanie as they try to run out the back door and shoots and kills both of them. Neighbors reported hearing these shots and then reported looking out, like, where is this coming from? And seeing John walk calmly from the Mazella's house back to his own, carrying a Mossberg shotgun, which is just a type of shotgun. It's very common. Wow. It's estimated that this attack only took about two minutes. So the police right away went to John's house. They went to the Sander house and John was inside. And they're, they're saying, you need to come out. Police, police, <laughs> put your hands up and come out slowly, right? <laughs> so he keeps, he refuses to come out. And he keeps saying, I'm dead already. I'm already dead. So it takes the police about 40 minutes to actually coax him to come out of the house. But he finally does. And he's immediately re arrested and held without bond. They take him into the police station. They interview him. He tells the police everything. I watched his interview. I, I watched part of it. I don't know if all of it is public, but I watched what was available. It's it's a good chunk of time. And he, he confesses. I mean, he tells them that he had to do it. He murdered the family or Sandy. He had to murder Sandy, that he wanted to make Sandy pay for what he was doing to him. And he said that when he shot him, he felt like he got his revenge. Oh, he literally says that he just snapped. He blacked out. He was so angry. And that when he came to, they were all dead and he was standing there holding the shotgun. So he oh my. tells him everything. He was charged with three counts of first degree murder and was facing the death penalty. So they take him to trial. This is interesting to me. He pleads not guilty. When they take him to trial. After he, he confessed. I do have a question, though, about that confession. Okay. If he blacked out, then how does... I mean, I guess he just, because he's standing there with a shotgun, knows he did it. But did he, like, explain who he shot first? Because how did he remember any of that if he's blacked no, out? No, he did not from what I saw. He did not explain that. Okay. They were able to... Okay. Uh, determine that based on the evidence of the crime scene. The investigators okay. were able to determine that timeline. He doesn't say that. What he says is, he says, I, I snapped, I blacked out, and I, I, you know, I only remember bits and pieces, and, but what I do remember is I came to, and they were dead, and I was holding the shotgun. And the investigator says to him, what do you think happened? And he said, I think I killed him. So, I mean, he, he does say that he doesn't have a clear memory of pulling the trigger and watching it happen and all that stuff. But he, he says, I was standing there with my shotgun. They were all dead. Nobody else was there. I snapped. Okay. But then he pleads not guilty. Well, <laughs> and this is the only th It doesn't say this. And maybe if I read the court tran transcripts or some of the filings, it would say this. But my guess is that he pled not guilty to first degree murder. Because that's what they were charging him with. And oh. so my thinking is that he is saying, no, I am not guilty of premeditating these murders. I am guilty mm. of second degree murder or manslaughter. Or he may be saying I'm pleading not guilty based on insanity. I mean, there are different. He, he, he enters a plea of not guilty. That doesn't mean he's saying I did nothing. 
necessarily. Yeah. It sounds like that, but legally that's not exactly what that means. So, you know, you do have to mm-hmm. give a little bit of grace when it comes to that. Okay. So at the trial, many neighbors and loved ones testified of the months of escalating tensions between John and the Mazella family. John during the trial was very agitated and erratic and had outbursts and at one point while Sal was testifying, they had to physically restrain him and remove him from the courtroom because he was screaming at Sal and pointing his finger and waving his fist and they could not calm him down. So they had to stop the court and remove him because Mm -hmm. he was acting crazy, a fool. Yeah. (laughs) Loud. We also learn, yes, it was very loud. Yes. Uh, (laughs) We also learn during the trial that John had been committed, committed two times previously and was described as psychiatrically dangerous. He met criteria, I know, he met criteria for bipolar one disorder with a history of mood and psychotic features and elements of paranoia, paranoia, got it, Mm -hmm. and obsessive compulsive disorders. John. Oh, my. It's a lot. That is a basket. It's a lot. That's a big basket. To carry around. And the man tried to go in and get help. Yeah, he did. The day before, right? Yeah. Two days before. <laughs> yep. Two days before this happened. Yes, he did. I wonder if he had said, um, I've been committed two times. Do you still want me to just pay $250 and let me walk out? Or are you going to let me walk out the store? <laughs> like, I mean, if somebody... Anyway. Com- <laughs> that's... that's. A- yes. No, I know. We'll get there. John tries to say... John... <laughs> He says, he doesn't try to say, he says that he was framed and being framed for all of these things Mm. and that the family was out to get him and that this was having the family killed or staging this whatever was their way of making sure it was really done. He suggests that maybe Sal killed the family, which is just outrageous. (laughs) I mean... Yeah, I mean, because then how did they get him there? Well, he blacked out the entire. Like, how are they going to know he blacked out? I, I, or why was he walking in? from the house to yeah. his own house with a shotgun minutes after the murders occurred? It would make yeah, it would make more sense for them to say for him to say he's being framed for like all the other stuff they're blaming. He, him he did for. say that he was saying that, and he was saying, but this not a part of it. And now they're framing me for murder. Mm. Okay. He says he was very drunk and very high and that he admitted to fighting with the family and to threatening them, but he absolutely did not kill them. Mm-hmm. That's what he said. Okay. So the trial lasted three weeks, and in the end, the jury found Jonathan Sander guilty of three counts of first-degree murder. At sentencing, the jury did not rule that John should receive the death penalty. So this is, we are a capital punishment state here in North Carolina, but they did give him, sentence him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. My guess is they did not do the death penalty based on mental illness, but I don't know that. I do want to read this quote because I was reading some of the court transcripts. And when I found this quote, I was like, wow, it's a mic drop. After sentencing, the judge says to John, quote, when the lights go dark, I want you to lie in your bed and think about that two minute period that was described in which you ruined the lives of not only your family, but the Mazellas. When you take your last breath, you're going to die alone and you're going to die forgotten. Get him out of my courtroom. Oh, my Goodness, oh. mic drop. <laughs> wow. I was like, that hurts my feelings, and I'm not even him. <laughs> like, that was mean. It was harsh. Wow. Go, Judd. Yeah. So I found this case very upsetting and frustrating because I think that there are very two clear events in which this awful tragedy could have been prevented from playing out the way that it did. Two, not just Mm -hmm. one, two very clear events where the system failed, all of them, all of us. 
One is that the Mazella family should have been granted more protection regarding that restraining order request. It had kept him away temporarily. So it may have been helpful until they were able to move away and not live next door to him anymore and cut ties with him. It could have helped keep them safe. I realize mm-hmm. that restraining orders are flawed in a lot of ways and just paper sometimes. But I think it had helped previously while it was temporary. And literally the day after it expires, he kills them. He Mm -hmm. comes to their home and he kills them. They should have done more to protect this family. Second, here I am. I'm going to get on my soapbox. You know how I feel about mental illness in this country. But he should have been helped. He went for help. He went for help, guys. He knew he was spiraling. He was aware that he was having a mental breakdown and that he needed to be stopped. And he asked for help and was Mm -hmm. turned away because of $250. It's a freaking shame. Also, he had been committed two times before. Why was he not receiving ongoing mental health treatment? Well, was that in Jersey, like before he moved? Yes. Yeah. But like that stuff, I mean, probably because he couldn't afford it. I would well, guarantee that that's yeah. that he couldn't afford it there, and it drives me crazy. It's a shame. There we go. Yes, I'm I agree. The box. There we go. There is a go I page for the two children. If you want to go and look it up, I will link it in the show oh notes. Gosh. Wow. Thanks, Kristen, for another doozy right here in our sweet little town. We're not all crazy. I'm telling you, it seems like that all North Carolina. I mean, we're getting up there with like Texas and Florida with these crazy cases in this area, but. Oh, no kidding. Gosh, I didn't realize so much happened in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Here we go. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Well, yeah. Thanks for the suggestion and thanks for telling that. I seriously don't know why I don't remember that. I feel like it would be something that I would hear in the news and be like, gosh, that's like a couple miles down the road. (laughs) Yes. I do remember hearing it for that reason. Yes. And I am also aware of the church in which Elaine Mazel and her husband were um, active in. So I I Mm. definitely remember about it happening and remember it being very jaw dropping at that time. And this is what's going on. Interestingly enough, I looked John Sander up in the North Carolina, like, offender registry. Well, it's, like, inmates, people who are actively incarcerated in North Carolina, and he wasn't there. I couldn't no. find him. So I, I, he must have been transferred out. I hope he was transferred out because he needed to be sent for mental health treatment as well. And they found a facility for him that would meet his needs in that case. But I don't know where he is. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, agree that he should have gotten help and disappointed that that didn't happen. And hopefully he's getting the help that he needs now. Also, um, you are pretty much validating Emery's reason for never leaving our garage door open. He yes. Leaving the garage door open. So and does his reason is because he doesn't want a snake to come in. <laughs> but mine is now, I don't want anybody to walk in my house and shoot me. <laughs> yes. Which... I don't know. I might piss a neighbor off enough to happen. <laughs> well, granted, they ha- I think they had the door locked. The one that led from... Right. The- he had to shoot garage. it in. He, he had to shoot so. the door. Yeah. So, And also, they were scared. They were scared of their neighbor. So it's not like right. they were like all willy-nilly like, oh, we're totally fine. You know, they there, there, were, there was a lead up here, a really clear yeah. escalation of threats and bad stuff that happened here. The whole thing is terrible. Both of these families lost tremendously in this case. It just drives me crazy because it was so preventable in more than one occasion. And I just think the system fails over and over and over again. And I hate it because people's lives are lost. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Well, Close your garages, guys, and hide in your closets. <laughs> exactly. That's all I got to say. <laughs> if you've learned nothing. Um, <laughs> yes. Learn a lesson here. Close your garage. Hide your closets. Um, and rate and review us because <laughs> we know you want to. All three and, very important lessons here. Yes. Keep listening. Keep, keep sending the suggestions because clearly you've given us some great ones. So we appreciate it. So, yep. Go rate and review us. Find us on social. 
close your garage. Did I say that right? Garage? I thought I said collage. <laughs> I know that you too. Close your garage and always remember, the world is crazy. Nope. The world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closets. <laughs>